welcome to Vaccination Café. We're coming to you today from the ESV Flu Summit in Brussels, where some leading experts are discussing the issues facing Europe and influenza. I'm joined today by Dr. Caroline Brown from the World Health Organization Regional Office for Europe, and also by Dr. LJ Tan, co-chair of the US Influenza Summit. Dr. Brown, seasonal influenza is a major issue uh, every year. I guess it's a, an annual pandemic of sorts. Um, who should be vaccinated against influenza every year? WHO has just published new uh, recommendations, which is an update of the 2005 recommendations. And the groups that should be targeted for vaccination are pregnant women, the elderly, persons with chronic disease, such as heart disease or, or lung disease, and children between six months and 59 months. So pregnant women are now a one of the priority target groups, although they have indeed been on the list for some time. Um, but how do you reassure people who are pregnant that it's safe to be vaccinated, given that they are the most concerned about themselves and about the, their, their children's health? What, what do you say to them? Well, the, the vaccine, uh, the recommendations that uh, WHO has brought out are based on the use of uh, inactivated seasonal influenza vaccine. And these vaccines have proven in the past 60 years to be safe, and they've also uh, proven to be safe in, uh, in, in pregnant women. Um, that being said, uh, anyone who, who is vaccinated could have um, a, a rare uh, event or, or reaction, and you always have to perform surveillance to, to determine was that due to the vaccine, and if so, to immediately take measures to take that, that vaccine um, uh, out, of, uh, out of rotation. Inactivated seasonal influenza vaccines have been known to cause um, some mild side effects, but nothing serious. And one of the other groups you were talking about today, uh, LJ, was um, health workers. Obviously, uh, there are several reasons, but talk us through some of the big reasons why health workers might really be, be high, at least, on the list. So I think, I think we look at three important things that the healthcare worker has to do for, for influenza immunizations. I think the first one, obviously, is patient safety. We, we, we do not want healthcare workers you know, infecting their, pa their patients with influenza, especially since patients in hospitals, for example, are vulnerable. And then the second thing we see healthcare workers is very important in is, is that you, know, you don't want to get sick. If you get sick, firstly, there's obviously the the fact that you can't help your patient anymore, but then you also bring the disease home to, 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 your, to your family. And then thirdly, we, 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 in the United States at least, we, you know, healthcare workers have a very important role in, in advising patients on getting vaccinated. And it's very hard to be a healthcare worker and say, you must get vaccinated, and then the patient says, well, are you vaccinated, Dr. Jones? And you say, well, actually, I didn't get vaccinated. So that's, that's you know, as that role model, as that influencer of patient decisions, we, we, you know, we just feel healthcare worker must get vaccinated for that reason. And I suppose it's the same in, in Europe, but uh, is there anything that the WHO can do at the regional office in Europe particularly to, uh, to encourage healthcare workers to take on that role model position? Yes, we, we are doing um, a number of activities in, in this area. So we, we, are, uh, we have developed um, a framework, if you like. It's, um, it's a guide for um, national vaccination programs. And it's a guide to strengthen the overall program and to target specific groups. So uh, as Dr. Tan mentioned, uh, healthcare workers are, are an important target group for uh, seasonal influenza vaccination, and they are also included in, in the new WHO recommendations. And with such a tool that, that we've developed and which is now being piloted, uh, a country can then target, um, use this tool to target uh, vaccination to, to in healthcare workers to try and improve. That. Now, to a certain extent, obviously, there's different views uh, or different recommendations, slightly different with, between countries. Um, but the US has cut through a lot of this by just going for universal uh, vaccination. Um, tell us a bit about why the US has taken this approach and what the impact has been. I think, I think the evolution of the influenza vaccination policy in the United States kind of is, you know, it, it followed the, the, the way the European Union is kind of going with some of their incremental risk-based recommendations. So back before 2000, we had the pregnant women, we had healthcare workers, uh, we added children later on. And I think what happened was, and, and off the top of my head, I, so, so I'm trying, I, I think by the time we reached 2009, we had about 18 
risk categories for influenza immunizations or, or what we call targeted populations because not all of them were high risk patients. Some of them were, for example, what we call the direct contacts. So in the United States, we vaccinated people who were directly in contact with folks that would be at high risk. And I think by the time we reached that, what we heard from a lot of our healthcare providers who vaccinated was that this is just too complicated. There were just too many people being recommended. And when we step back and look at the pragmatic aspect of programmatic implementation, it became very clear to us that, you know, at that point in time with 18 different types of recommendations, we were already covering 85% of the United States population. And so, and, and the recognition is that the other 15%, which were the healthy 18 to 49 year olds, well, absolutely, while they did not have the severe complications from flu, um, they still got flu and they still got sick. And so why don't we want to protect them as well? And so it became a simple pragmatic step to just go to a universal recommendation, which essentially is that in the United States, if you're six months of age or older, you are recommended for influenza vaccination. All right, as you put it today, if, it ha if he has a pulse, vaccinate him. But are there any downsides? What were the arguments put by people who didn't want to go down that road? So this is a recommendation, it's not a mandate. So that's important to keep in mind. So it's a recommendation, we're not forcing people. But there are other things, you know, there are the same, the same arguments you hear against the mandatory healthcare worker. For example, well, the vaccine isn't always effective every year when it doesn't match, no, no, so this, isn't, that too, isn't that too strong of a recommendation since we don't have a perfect vaccine? And then the response to that obviously is don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good because uh, there's actually gonna be, a, I was telling Dr. Brown this earlier on, there's gonna be a publication coming out in the next couple of months from, some, uh, from, from the CDC at the United States that essentially show that even when there isn't a perfect match of vaccine, the use of influenza vaccine in the high risk groups especially is cost savings and in all groups is cost effective. So no matter how you look at it, vaccine is better in the arm than on a shelf. And so I think we're moved, that's, that supports the universal recommendation. So Dr. Brown, what, how do you feel about, about that? I mean, we obviously don't have it in Europe, but could we eventually? Countries can certainly decide to, to make those recommendations. Uh, I think the publication that Dr. Tan just mentioned, this kind of data are going to be really, really important um, and the, the other data, other information that are going to be, that's going to be extremely important is to show that uh, increasing the coverage is reducing the burden of disease. So reducing the number of people getting severely ill and reducing the number of deaths. This is the kind of critical information that could um, encourage countries to adopt such a, a policy. And just to play devil's advocate, is there any danger that if you say everyone should have the vaccine, that people who are, have chronic diseases or are pregnant say, well, there's nothing particularly special. This is a vaccine for everyone if they want it, whereas perhaps they are at a higher risk than the general population. Do you think it, it uh, dilutes that message? I think that's an important issue. I, you, you brought that up, yes, right, in your presentation. I think that was a really, really key issue that you, even though you're saying everyone, we recommend everyone to get vaccination, how do you make sure that your cystic fibrosis patient gets vaccinated? That's really key. But you're on the case uh, to a certain extent on this already in the US, I guess, because you have been trying to say everyone should get it plus Correct. and tailor some messages. What are you doing? And maybe mention something about how patient organizations Correct, can absolutely. And I think that's where the patient organizations can really come in because we did hear a little bit about that today. I think, I think in the US, we, you know, we're only in our second year, so, so that's a caveat, but we are learning a little bit about how to do that kind of focused messaging. I think the, the big thing we've learned in the United States is that for the public, a, a simple message works best. And so the simple message for us is simply, is, is essentially, there's a universal recommendation, anyone six months of age sh should get vaccinated. And that's what, we go, that's what we lead with. And what we then do is we try to figure out who is going to deliver the message to those important people, Th those populations that if they don't get vaccinated could really, really, really get sick. And so we use the specific healthcare providers. So we, we're talking to the cardiologists, we're talking to the endocrinologists, we're talking to the geriatricians, we're talking to the, to, to the specialty physicians that take care of these people and emphasize preg uh, ob ob uh, what we call the uh, obstet obstetricians and gynecologists to tell them you need to really now work on these populations. Then we're also using patient advocacy groups. We're using the American Heart Association, the American Association for Retired People. These are patient groups that, that focus on these, these targets and telling them, you need to help us, you know, because you know, we have this universal recommendation, but your folks, if they don't get vaccinated, are really gonna pay the price. And so that's how we're trying to learn how to target. But again, it, there, there is a caveat, we're still learning that, and, and you're right. You know, one of the things we do know 
is that if you caveat a universal recommendation, the universal recommendation becomes useless. You know, it's the, you know, you don't want, we don't want influenza in the United States to become the only universally recommended vaccine that has a caveated message. You know, we recommend chickenpox vaccine universally, but we don't caveat it. We don't say, but you need to do this. You know, we just say vaccinate everybody, you know, every child with, with varicella. We don't say you need to target those, you know, we, we just don't. And, and so we don't want flu to become that either. Well, on that note, uh, thank you both very much for joining me. It was great to have you. Thank you for watching. Please do check out the other videos on the Vaccines Today YouTube channel. Follow us on Twitter, Vaccines Today, if you can. And of course, keep checking in on vaccinestoday.eu. Until next time, thank you very much for joining us.